Hello and welcome to Zim Explore. I am Dr. Abstract and in this Zim Explore we're going to take a look at Texture Actives which is a way to get Zim into 3JS. So let's go to the Zim site now at zimjs.com. We're going to hit the what's new section or hit it here or there. And what's new in Zim 015 are Texture Actives. And we've done a bubbling video. So we do bubbling videos when new things come out. We did a bubbling video taking you through these three, taking you through these three, and then a third bubbling video taking you through the code of the first one. Uh, but explorers are a little bit more in depth where we can just talk about everything. We look through more complex code. And so we're going to go into this one now. We're gonna do an explore on each of these. Isn't that exciting? Uh, because this is very exciting to have uh, wonderful components and effects and the conveniences of Zim uh, inside of 3JS on any model or any mesh. Um, so here we have uh, a bunch of examples of that. In most cases it will be flat because Zim is 2D, but in this one that we're going to take a look at we're going to see that it's mapped on cylinders as well and that would be possible and here we are mapped on a cube or a box. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go into this one and see what it's like. When I roll over this, it stops. So we're using first person controllers. So that's that, sorry if I'm making you queasy. And I'm going to, well, let's close this. So interact with the fat rings on the tubes to solve the simple puzzle. Okay, so let's go. I'm using WASD and the first person controller and indeed I can pick these up. So that's Zim mapped onto a cylinder like that. Let's go over and do this one. And note that it's not interactive here. So that's a near far and now it is interactive. Now we pick that up and drop it down there. And that's what we have to do to solve it. So these things are textures. The floor is a Zim texture as well. And so is that initial menu. And we can see those by hitting the T key. So I just hit T. And now we're showing the actual Zim that is being mapped on. So this was mapped. And uh, we can use this or we can sort of drag as well. Um, but there's the floor texture. And here are those. Note that this one is done. We completed that one. We completed this one. We have not completed this one. So these are live as well. So we can pick that up. And now here's the blue strip on the on the must, uh, mustard or whatever, dark mustard. We've just completed that one. So we're going to go out into the real world, <laughs> so to speak, into the 3JS world and see if it's completed. So you can get there like this or hitting the, the T key. And let's look for the mustard one. Where was that? That's not mustard. <laughs> okay, there it is right there and sure enough it is completed so once again if we come to here and move it off of completion and hit the t key you can see that it's off of completion here on on that side okay all right hey we want it to be complete please it's back to complete so that is alive and if we finish this one off wasd uh do We do this one no isn't this cool so that means you can put interactive puzzles hey success we've witnessed a monumental moment okay wonderful we did it so let's go into the code and see how we coded this yay how exciting so we'll drop this down here we are in zim 015 that's the latest version of zim that just launched we're bringing in Zim 3, and that brings in 3JS, uh, one version 155, and the orbit controls, the first person controls, and the GLTF loader. Okay, just some handy things. We're also bringing in from the pizzazz module, uh, th this makes patterns. So pizzazz 1 makes backgrounds like mm, boomerangs and I don't know, uh, kidneys and stuff. And the Pizzazz 2 makes a bunch of icons. Pizzazz 3 makes a bunch of patterns. And that's what was giving us those, uh, the patterns for the floor. <clears throat> Here uh, is Zim. And we may have, you may have already seen the earlier 
bubbling on the code and we talked about Zim. So I'm kind of speaking to two groups here. One group is people who have not used Zim before and are coming in from say 3JS to use this, that's great. And I'm catering more towards those people. And then we also have the people that have used Zim that haven't used 3JS before. And so there's some new things for them as well. And then, of course there's people that have used both, but uh, welcome. And there are many ways, though, to learn Zim uh, before, <laughs> you know, we can't expect to really learn Zim in this in this video. So let me just show you quickly out here in Zim under the learn section right here, zimjs.com. And then the learn section, there's an editor which will help you through, including a start demo. And we can try the code right in the editor. Uh, for videos, there's this series right here, Zim Basics, and that will take you through just how to add things to Zim. What's a registration point? What are containers? Uh, let's put some components on here. What kind of um, fun things can we do with Zim? All right, so that, that would be a good one for you to look through at least the first three or four videos, and that would give you a, a, a good enough grounding. We'll try and mention things as we go along here, but uh, you might have already seen the bubbling, in which case we'd be mentioning the same things over. It could, could kind of get a little bit uh, redundant for you. There we are making a frame. We're setting those dimensions. This is an explore, though. It allows us to try out the code a bit more than the bubbling. We're setting these dimensions. This is the stage color, the backing stage color, and when we're ready, it calls this function. It gives us the frame, a reference to the frame, the stage that we made. The stage is like our scene. It comes from uh, Flash, uh, it comes from Director, <laughs> all, all the way back through interactive media. We, we call it a stage, that's our metaphor. And then a width and a height for those. We have some comments that you should definitely read if you're going to be working with inner, inner uh, texture actives. Okay, so I'm gonna, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna reduce those down though. And here indeed is a texture active. This is for the pattern that's going on the floor and we're saying, hey, make it the height and uh, make it the width, the height <laughs> and the height, the height. Uh, color black, animated false and interactive false. So we aren't interacting with the floor. Therefore, this will turn off the ray casting. It's not even animated. Therefore, we won't bother updating the cache once we've cached it once. We can center that on the stage if we want. And there is the make pattern that's happening. Why don't we just get rid of the rest of this stuff? So from here, here on down, and we'll comment that stuff out and just see what this looks like. So if I save that here, that, uh, well, right click and say open in browser. There's the pattern that it made centered on the stage. So that's pattern. <clears throat> so as we're building this to start, we might want to put it on the stage. Eventually what's going to happen is whatever size we make this object, this texture active object, it's just going to cache that and take its cache canvas, it's called. So that's the, the canvas that the caching writes to. And it's going to use that cache canvas as a canvas texture in 3JS. So the size and position of it really won't matter here. We could do whatever we wanted to it here. And as a matter of fact, the texture actives object tiles this. It just takes everything that we've made, every texture active we made, and just tiles it from the left to the right, provides a slider to slide on through and a swiper to swipe on through. And that's uh, what we see when we hit the T key. Okay, do you remember that? So that's this stuff right here. Just a bunch of Zim things tiled across the, uh, the space. Okay, um, so if we come back over here. This is make pattern. It comes from the pizzazz module. And we're saying make noise. We could make slants like this. And then we would get slants. Those slants have been randomized in color. There's also dots, there's stars, there's different uh, stripes and stuff. Um, those have been randomized with this array. If we don't want them randomized, we can do a series. So this is called the Zim V system, or Zim, it was made in Zim version five, Zim V. 
and it's dynamic parameters. It allows us to pass in a parameter that then the object uses after it's like while it's being made in a sense. So it's perfect for say tiling. Uh, if if we wanted to tile things with different colors, we can't put a random color in beforehand because it would pick that random color and just do that random color. So we made a system that allows the parameters to be dynamic like this. And so here's a, what a series looks like. And now every time it goes to make a stripe, it picks the next thing from the series. Isn't that cool? You can imagine this is very powerful. You can also pass in a function and it will pick from the results of the function. You can pass in a min max object and it will pick from that range. So those are ZIMV values, dynamic uh, parameters. Very, very powerful. We've open sourced that on, on GitHub. Um, it works with style, so Zim's got style. We can style things and we can pass in these dynamic uh, styles as well. It's great for like when you're emitting particles, you can emit random particles, blah, 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 blah. It's good for intervals. You can emit, you can do intervals and pick from random values or a min and max or do it in a, seri a series. So you could play music, for instance, at a certain timings. Okay, anyway, enough for that. Uh, part of this explore, though, is to introduce you, as, as we're going, to some of the exciting features in Zim. It's an amazing JavaScript Canvas framework with lots of conveniences and exciting uh, code. Okay, so we don't want to do that. Let's undo. Bop, 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 bop. And we'll go back to the noise. That was just some pattern settings. And then we're centering it on the pattern right there. So this is the texture active. It's like a container. And then, well, it is a container, as a matter of fact. Um, and then we're centering it on the pattern. Just beware, everything that we want to show up on the textures needs to be in a texture active. And therefore, anything that we're making down below here, we have to remember to make sure to add it to that texture active so that it's seen. Okay, we can have multiple different texture actives. Uh, and indeed we do. So there's the first one for the pattern. Let's carry on and look at the cylinders now. So why don't we comment out the pattern for now? Oop. It's weird. No, everything became commented. So we did what? We commented out the pattern and let's bring back the cylinder. So, I just learned that you can collapse comments. So that's pretty cool. But it, it collapses the bank of comments. And so when everything became comments, the whole thing uncollapsed or something. <laughs> I was like, what? Okay, so we've got some colors that we're going to make for the cylinders. We're also going to store the cylinders in an array so that we can access them later on down below. We're looping through the colors. This is a Zim loop. And we can loop through an array. We can loop through by by a bunch of, like by a number, say loop ten times. We can loop through an object literal. We can loop through a container and get its children. We can loop through a dictionary. We can loop through a, an HTML collection, etc. So Zim loop is very versatile and easy. And so there we are looping through colors, and we're getting an index. Do we even need the index? Yeah. Okay, so we're accessing the color at the index, although if we set a series, we could have just set colors and anyway, blah, blah, blah. Um, let invert equal the invert of the color. Okay, so we're inverting the color that we're picking. Okay, we get a color, colors at I. Color, it's just the color, I don't need I. Okay, in which case we can get rid of this. Boop, and that. Boop. Does that still work? And what are we doing? So we're looping through those things and we're going to be putting them somewhere, probably on the stage, maybe. Yeah, we got an add to. So we've made a cylinder, which is a texture active. The height and the height. It doesn't have to be, but we're uh let's see, how does that work? We're mapping onto a cylinder. Uh, we just probably might wrap around a few times, like wrap around the cylinder a few times. Maybe it doesn't matter because we're mapping 
you know, this, this uh, uh, square onto a cylinder and it's got a line going across it. So it's, it's pretty easy to uh, understand, I suppose. We're, we're gonna see that in just a moment. So there's the color, color, oh, not colors plural, but just color, not two alpha. So there's their color that we brought in right here to alpha and we're adding it to the stage. Then we've got a bar that we're making and we've got a ring. So we've got a couple things. The bar is the width of the cylinder. So that's the width of here and it's 100 high and it's the inverted color. Okay, we're setting the alpha of that. We're centering it on the cylinder. All right, and we're setting it to drag with the boundary of the cylinder and local bounds true. Uh, if you set something to drag, it will assume that it's based on the stage coordinates, but we're moving these cylinders across in their tile. We're moving, uh, well, it'd probably be okay even if we didn't have that because the tile is at zero, zero anyway. But uh, to be safe, we'll set the local boundaries to true on that. And let's see what we're making here. This might look a bit strange because I have a feeling. Yeah, it looks strange. But there's the bar that we're making. There's the bar on the one under. There's an alpha on here. So we got a lot of bars. Might be best just to look at one color. And then we've got all these white lines. We're going, what the heck are all those white lines? Well, the white lines are this ring right here. And it looks like we've got the ring is the width. Oh yeah, the ring probably should be the height and that way it doesn't go across. Although it doesn't matter if it's all on the material. Okay, yeah, that's a little bit easier to understand, I suppose. Um, so that white line is coming across the, uh, the height, because <laughs> we got a square. That's the height right here, height. And then we're making the width, the height as well. How's that for confusion? Waha! Um, right, we've kind of skipped through a few things here, but we're dragging the bar. Uh, when we press up, we're saying if the bar hits the bounds of the ring. So if the bar, if this bar hits the bounds of this ring, okay, then it's a hit. And what do we do when it hits? We're probably having an error because we don't have an answer. Okay, let's bring back the answer. That's doing a check to see if we've done them all, but we'll come back to that in a second. Do we have an error? Yeah, okay, testing. So that's why I didn't snap in place. So when we pick up that, it will now snap in place. Let's try it again. Okay, so we'll snap in place. Because of the alpha, there's other bars and other colors underneath here as well. There we go, snaps in place. We could lock it so you couldn't pick it up again, but for now, we, we didn't do that. So bar dot on press up, if the bar is hitting the bounds of the ring, that just checks the two rectangles. So it checks the rectangular bounds of this bar. Is it hitting the rectangular bounds of this line right here, which is a very small line. It's called a ring because when it goes around the cylinder, it looks like a ring. <laughs> Doesn't look much like a ring here though, does it? Uh, all right, and then we're saying bar dot animate. It's y property to the rings y minus the bar height divided by two. Yes. All right. So we have some options here. It would have been easier if we centered the registration point of this bar, so that when we dropped it on there, we could just animate the bar's x y position to the rings y position. Right? But instead, we have a top right registration point. Oh, you know what? Actually, that was back when we were setting the boundaries to zero, zero. Sure, we could do that. We could center reg the, the bars. So instead of centering it on the cylinder, so here's what centering it on the cylinder would look like. Um, dot outline, dot outline. So a dot outline will give us an outline around our rectangle, around our object. There it is, it's a red, unfortunately it's red in the background. But this thing right here is, the round circle is its registration point. So right now that's the X position of the bar and the Y position of the bar, okay? 
And as we drag that on there, we were wanting to animate it uh, onto the onto the ring. But if we center reg this, center reg like that, and that 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 required some slight math. There's now the registration point like so. And what we can do is just get rid of this slight math and just set the y to the rings y rather than minus the bar height because we've centered the registration point of that. Okay, so let's try right now. See if it still works. Yep, it does. That's a little bit simpler for us to look at because we've center regged. The reason why we hadn't center regged it initially is that we had a drag boundary of um, zero, zero in X and Y, and then a width of zero and a height of the height here minus the uh, minus the height of it. And that allowed us to drag this thing within that drag boundary. And then we realized, oh, we could just set the drag boundary to be inside the you know, inside this whole thing. And that keeps it inside this whole object. So that's that was developed a little bit later. Uh, for the first half of Zim, we always had to drag within an X, Y width height rectangle. Then, and that would be the registration point within that. Then we sort of did some programming magic in behind and said, okay, you can put the circle on the stage and just say the boundary is the stage. And then it keeps the circle within the stage. So that's a little bit different, not its registration point within the stage, but the actual size of the bounds within the, the stage. And that's what we've done here. And that means that it, we may as well just center reg it so that it lines up exactly on the Y. <laughs> All right, so hopefully that's not a bunch of garbly gook for you, but uh, there you go. Um, when we press up, we're animating now just to the rings Y. That becomes easier to look at. And we're doing an elastic out ease with this time. And we're going to call, when it's done, that animation is done, we're going to call test answer. Down below, test answer loops through all of the cylinders. It is going to see if we're within a certain range, if we're within five pixels from the ring. We could have done this. Let's see. We don't want to do it just with a hit test. I mean, we could have done it with just a hit test if it's... Um, we're testing the answers. Well, why we're snapping it on there. Why are we bothering testing the answers each time? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that the test was done to find out... It, <laughs> I can't put it close to it. But it, uh, the test was initially done without the animation to snap in. So we didn't have the animation to snap in. We had the test going and the test was saying, are we close enough? Are we close enough? Are we close enough? Are we close enough? So that's what this is doing. Actually, now we can just probably put an equal to. So if, don't even bother with all this stuff. That would be if the cylinder dot, no, if the, so we've got a cylinder each time. If the cylinder dot ring dot y is equal to the cylinder dot bar dot y. Then return false. So we've got this answer coming. A loop will return true. So this is a zim loop. If it finishes looping, it's true. So what we're doing is we've got this answer. And if it's equal, then we're pass we're returning false. If we return false, then answer will be false. So if it's not equal, we want it there. Okay. So if it's not equal, if they're not equal, then we return false and that kind of cancels the loop in a sense. So if answer, that means it completed all of them without returning false, then we're going to have the success here. Well, now we got to test it to find out if we're successful. Uh, I have a trick way to test it, although we've got all this stuff commented out, don't we? Uncomment. Boop. Trick way to test it. Okay. And refresh here. Something's a little broken. What could it be? Hmm. 
<laughs> there it is. We need the floor. Okay. <laughs> Which was in the minified comments for some reason. Okay. So over here. There we go. So our trick way to test it, rather than go and actually do all these things, which we could do, is to go T, come on over here. We already did that one. Do this one. Whoop. Do this one. Oh. Hmm. What do you think about that? So you see how that one started close to it? It's not totally snapped in. It started close to it. Do we have another one that started on the, on the line? No. Uh, anyway, that one started something like that. And if it were close enough, we might have accepted it. But now we have to go in and actually put it right on the line, which could be tricky if it started. So we, we almost would want to do a test to make sure that we don't start like this, because that's not quite snapped right in the middle, and you wouldn't even be able to tell. Anyway. <laughs> It's like, ay, ay, ay. all right, anyway, we, we don't need to go into all that. And look, we've snapped them all in there. Let's go back with our T. And yay, it says success. So um, that was our sneak way of doing it. And what that also says is if you are using the texture actives for a puzzle like this and you don't want people hitting the T key and going in and solving the puzzle without even going through your world, then you just need to turn the T key off, all right? So the T key was primarily for us when we're developing so that we can go and take a look between the 3 three JS world and the Zim uh, flat world. Okay, um, so you can quite easily turn the T key off, though. How is this for an explorer? You guys doing okay? Oh, that's the sound of it's okay to go get a cookie or go get some licorice. Anyway, uh, we are exploring, which means we're allowed to go off on tangents and kind of look around and hopefully this is all right for you. If it is, uh, make sure you come into zimjs.com slash slack, zimjs.com slash discord. We'd love to hear from you there. All right, so where'd we get to back here? We were talking cylinders. We kind of bounced back and forth around in this bar and ring thing here. Hopefully that wasn't too much for you because we made some changes. And we changed our answer as well. Uh, do you need to know what we did here? Right. When we have the answer, dialog.label.text success. We haven't even seen the dialog yet, so why don't we wait on that? And we're scaling that new those new words to the dialog. And we're adding that uh, the camera back. Oh, we're adding the mesh, the dialog mesh back to the camera. Okay, well, we haven't seen that stuff yet. So let's wait on that here is the dialogue oh hey now we've seen the dialogue well oh, yeah, there it is right here so here's the dialogue texture active we are making it look like it looks with the width and the height divided by two pink and purple these are just whatever we want to build with and we can always scale it down below when we make the texture um or sorry when we make the mesh We've got a corner, we've got a border color, and a border width. So what we're talking about here is the dialog. This guy right here. So this white border and that corner is being made. We're going to add the logo. We're going to add this little close button, and there's the label on it. Note that we go from pink to purple. Is it transparent? It doesn't look like it is. I don't think I can see through that. the space bar so that doesn't bug me crazy. We can make the texture active logo right on the texture active class. We're positioning that 50 from the left, one from the top, and on the dialogue. Okay, probably just the one was to make the make this look a little bit better, I think. Uh, the T key. Well, I don't know. That's probably fine. You'll find that in Zim, the border is half inside the object bounds and half outside the object bounds. So it is possible that if we didn't move that down one, we might have lost half a pixel on the texture. So uh, that's maybe, I don't 
no, I think though we accommodated for that. I'm not sure. It looks like it's accommodated here in this box. You see when we've tiled this, we said, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, and we don't want half this outside of it. So I think we worked that out, but anyway. We're adjusting the height only. Why did we do this? The backing. Oh yeah, the backing height only dialog height minus 100. Why did we do that? Dialog backing height only dialog height minus 100. I am not sure. Dialog backing position, did we put it where in the center? And dialog backing controls, false. Backing controls, false. That must have something to do with the spinning. Let's see how it spins at the moment. That seems fine. It is holding it way even way down here and then letting go. So it's like it's not as big as it thinks it is. Hmm. The height only 100. The backing is a property of the dialog, of the texture active here. The border color, that will have that will have all the border stuff. I don't know what we're doing there exactly. Um, maybe it'll come out as, as we move along here. So interact with the fat rings. So here's the, the label that we're going to put on that. And we're making it a color white. We're aligning it in the center. The alignment in the center and allows it to, as we change its um, the dialog size, that that dialog will always stay in the center. If it were just the default align left, when we go to change the dialog, it would look possibly left aligned. We're scaling it to the dialog 8080 and centering it on the dialog. So this scales it to the dialog container, 80% and 80%. And we're moving it down a little bit so that this is relative movement. We could also pose from the center and position it 14 from the center in the Y, but anyway, that, that, done it that way. We've got a button. This is the small round button with a corner of 40. That's The corner is the same as half the width and height, and that makes it round. We've got an X there, border colors, border width. We're positioning that up at the top of the dialog, 60, 15 from the top. That seems odd too. I think we might have a dialogue size that is different. Let's put a let's put on the dialogue dialogue dot outline. Let's see what we've got in terms of the dialogue size here. Hmm. See an outline on the dialog at the moment. Dialog is what? Dialog is a texture active. Um, might be gone once we tile it. We wouldn't see it. Now we should see it at some point. Not sure why that didn't show up. Well, anyway, when we press our button, when we tap on it there, we're moving, uh, we're removing the camera, or sorry, moving the mesh from the camera. So we haven't seen this kind of stuff yet, but basically we're, if you're imagining our texture active mesh down below in our 3JS is in the camera itself, like we've added it to the camera rather than directly to the scene and therefore everywhere the camera looks we see it that's how we're doing our 
sort of keeping it right there in the middle. And we've just removed the mesh when we tap the close button. So we tap the close button, oop, removes it from the mesh. I'm not sure what's going on with the dialog backing and size there. We should have been able to outline that and see it, but uh, let's do an outline on the backing. Dialog dot backing dot outline. Outline is just sort of like a snapshot in time. It tries to put uh, something around the bounds of it. So there it is. That's as expected. It's that size. But the question, oh, of course. Yeah, okay. Do you see it? We, um, this is the backing and the rest of the stuff, we want to be outside of it. So we want the top of this to be out. So that's why we've moved it down 100. We just moved the backing down 100, of course. So that these things can be up on top of it. Okay. Ooh, how we managed to make the bottom lower, how did we do that, do you think? Our texture active has a height of that. Did we scale the backing? Yeah, that does it, height only. So when we say, hey, set the height only to 100 less, and we're positioning it in the center, right? So that's why we've got some stuff underneath here. That all makes sense now. Let me pause this for a sec. We've squeezed the dialog backing. It's when we set the height only, it squeezes it. If we, if we just set the height, then it would automatically it would scale the width proportionally. It would keep the same proportion like an image does in HTML. When you say make the image height this, it will match the width proportionally, keep the same aspect ratio. But if you say height only, then it only changes the height, and we've made it 100 less so that we have a little bit up at the top, and we've also got a little bit at the bottom that we don't really need, but so be it. It was probably just to keep the other stuff all in line a little easier. Alrighty, that makes sense. So sorry for the kerfuddles there, but that was a little subtlety, I suppose, to move that about. Good, and now we move into the 3JS. So we've seen the cylinders. We saw them a little bit quickly, but I think if you analyze the, this, that was more just programming stuff. If you analyze that, you'll figure out what's, what's going on in there. Hopefully you're still with us. <laughs> And down below, then, we're moving into the 3JS. So time for another stretch, if you want. And hopefully this won't go bad. It's uh, here we are, the 3JS. We're setting the width and the height to the windows width and height. This is using the 3 helper library. And that was initially made to bring 3JS into Zim and overlay 3JS into Zim. It was just an easier way for our, we Zim people to make the scene, to make the renderer, to make, because we already have a renderer in Zim, um, to make all that stuff without seeing it, uh, abstracting it. Okay, so that will make the scene, the camera, and the renderer for us like that. We do have a raw version of the very first one. We looked at that raw version in the last, in the bubbling of the code. We looked at the raw version. So we, we have a only 3JS and Zim without the three helper module. That's this one. But anyway, here's the three helper module. We are turning color management true on. And if we do that, that means we've got to look at down below when we do the lights. We have to make sure that we do our lights in a new manner. Uh, but we have. Uh, I don't know if there's a few other things we have to think about, but I think that's good. <clears throat> that might even be the default. I can't remember. Let's have a look. Put that out. We toyed around with that default a little bit. Yeah, it looks like it is the default, so probably we don't need that anymore. Okay, because those look fine there, the lighting that we expected. So we'll take that out. And texture active true, that says, hey, don't don't scale it as expected. So when we brought 3JS into the Zim frame, we'd have to scale 3JS to fit and to, to, to say consistent, consistent with the Zim frame. But if we're using 3JS as 3JS, then we don't want Zim to do that scaling for us. 
So we set texture active true. That also might set some other flags of things that we want to do in the three modules. So anyway, that's fine. And we're storing local variables of scene, camera, and render. We're making a skybox in the normal 3JS way. We're adding first person controls. That's available. We've imported that automatically in Zim 3. Otherwise, you'd have to import that your own way. And also, if we have the three helper module, we can access the canvas, or you could have used the 3JS, a three, or no, render.dom element there as well. We've done some configuration of those controls. And we considered abstracting this, and we're still sort of thinking about it into the three module. We just, for this latest version of our three module, uh, which is 2.3, I think, we brought in the three, the, the first person controls, and we could abstract this stuff into it. I'm not quite sure if we should or not. That is also the key down for pause. Might make it easier. I don't, I don't like having to think about this stuff with the delta, so. Uh, probably we'll be taking that and just making it work with the first person controls automatically if that's the type of controls we're using. I'm not sure yet. Okay, here's the texture actives part. Yay! So we have a new texture actives plural as opposed to texture active singular. We're passing in the dialogue, the pattern, and that array of cylinders we made. So there's our Six cylinders, I can't remember, was it five cylinders, six cylinders? Let's have a peek. Hi there. One, two, three, four, five, six cylinders that we made. Each time it was a, a texture active and we must have pushed that into the array at some point. There it is, cylinders.push the cylinder. So we have an array of these texture active objects right here, each with a draggable bar and this ring that is a white line that's now the right width, <laughs> which is the height. <laughs> yep, thank you, thank you very much. Um, alrighty, so coming on down then to our texture actives. So the dialogue the, the, the pattern on the floor, remember that from a long time ago? That was the little squares. We're passing in a reference to our three object, our, our Zim 3 <laughs> object, <laughs> 3JS 3, the Zim, the render, the scene, the camera, and the controls. Once again, if we always were using three, we could have made, and we could have even tested and sort of said, hey, if, uh, if we're using three, we already have the render, the scene, the camera. We don't necessarily have the controls though. So we would have had to put the control, this stuff probably before that. So we don't have to go undefined, undefined, undefined. And anyway, in the end, we just wanted to make it more apparent. So by the way, there you go. And if you don't have the three module, you just put null there and then pass these guys in and that all works as well. So this is your layer that you're on. Sorry, this is the near far right here. So we have to come 150 close to it. Uh, by the way, you know, all that stuff is your traditional 3JS. We have, for instance, the camera is set up. Where is it set up? Right here, only 100 away from it. In the last version, it was 1,000 away from it. So the various scales and stuff, you know, you know how 3JS works, hopefully. Uh, in the dawn of 3D, when I was doing 3D back in Flash, it was like, everything I would put somewhere, I couldn't see it. And it's going, where the heck is it? And it's because my camera was looking in the wrong place or I was inside the box or, you know, it was, <laughs> it was always a headache. So anyway, just watch that for your, your dimensions. It may be that you're coming into 3JS for the first time. You could be watching this from the Zim side and don't know 3JS. Uh, I think you'll find 3JS is quite easy to use. Yay, it's very much like Zim. So I, I consider ourselves uh, brother sisters or brothers. <laughs> uh, we're very similar. We're, we're 2D and 3JS is 3D, but we have a uh, nice simplicity to our framework. So that's, that's wonderful. Okay, coming on down then. Where were we? Let's work on the cylinders. So that's your near far. If you don't have that, if you just leave that off, that means you can interact with any of these things from as far away as you want. 
we'll leave those off. And now I'll close that and take a look. This, this one way down here, I'm picking it up and I'm snapping it in. Uh, if you're on the texture, we don't use the controls. If you're off the texture, we use the controls. And you can see that it's really hard to kind of stay on the texture. It's sort of annoying trying to, trying to snap this in from so far away. So I think that that interferes with your controls. Every time you come across one of these things, it sort of jitters the controls. So you want, you only want to do, um, you, you want to get closer to that and then it makes sense to sort of pause the controls. So that's what this near far is doing right on the end. And that'll be up to you how far away you want it that to do. <laughs> I'm trying to pause my, my other, I have this on my other screen. And if I just don't pause it, I, I'm leaving it spinning like that on my other screen. It's like, ah! So anyway, pause and then come on over here. Right. We are testing the answer every time we ray up. Do we need to do that? Let's see. Ray up test answer. We have a test answer. Do we need to do that anymore? We have a test answer every time we mouse up, in a sense. Where is that? Right here. So bar dot press up. We go ahead and test an answer. So do we need one on a raycast up? Mm, no, I don't think we do need that anymore. Because we would test the answer in all the bars. Okay, so if this possibly could have worked, yeah, I guess uh, this is any Raycast test answer. So that means even if we close the window. So when we close the window at the start, we would test the answer at that point. Maybe we needed that just in case the answers were already set, uh, but we've now got the answers need to be snapped into place specifically rather than just, oh, you happen to have the bar on the ring. You know, oh. so testing the answer would have been that very off case where all the bars were already on the rings close enough, you know, that, that it's random. So, you know, it could happen, I guess. But I don't think we actually need to test the answer on the text tractor. I'll just, uh, we are testing on mm, press up that was on bar press up bar press up so I'll just leave that then I think that that's the case and here we are with our cylinders so we're almost there just how do we do the cylinders we've got some light dialogue and adding okay so a few more things in 3js left to do so the cylinders, we've got a geometry that is going to match the height and be only 30 in radius. I think that is. We have a, there's the pattern dot canvas. So which one's the pattern? Oh, this is a floor. Okay. So, ah, right. Okay. So we've got a big circle. This is not the cylinder. Let's, let's move this a little bit, shall we? That's the floor. There we go. <laughs> floor. All right, that'll help. So this is that big circle floor, and we put the patterns canvas on that. So just watch out for that. It's not the pattern. The pattern is a Zim object. We have to provide a canvas. So it's the canvas property of that pattern that is put into the canvas texture. Okay, that means a canvas. Yay, and if you are coming from the Zim side, you might remember that this would usually be the cache canvas, cache canvas, like that. But that's a little bit unwieldy. Uh, you know, it's sort of like, okay, I get it, we've cached it, and this is the canvas of that cache, okay. But we sort of, we inherited that from 3JS. So Zim is built on 3JS and caching is part of the 3JS uh, libraries. And they provide a cache canvas for anything that's been cached. And then you've got to update that cache anytime you make the change. But anyway, we thought, hey, uh, let's spare people and just call it canvas. So when we do the texture active here, 
and we do one of these texture actives, it will, the system will automatically cache this and put the cache canvas into the cache parameter. Yay, that's just a little bit easier. So there we are providing the canvas. Here's the material. We're mapping on a texture. If that's all we're doing, we could probably do this on one line without too much difficulty. There we go. Um, did we talk about the Zim Duo technique? I'm not sure. We did in the last, in the bubbling, when we went through the bubbling and introduced sort of Zim at that point as well. We talked about Zim Duo. You may have noticed. Let me just take a pause here. I'll mark this where we're at F1 and pop on up to the top again. You may notice that when we make pattern, we've done the brackets there as well. But it just depends on how much we have to do. So here's a test answer. Let's see, there's the dialogue. Uh, okay, they're, they're all like that. Let me choose a different thing. So here's a label. We put the squiggly brackets in the label. That's a configuration object, it's called. But actually, the text is the first parameter. So we could have just put the text there. The next parameter is the size. So we could say null. The next parameter is the color. So we could put the color there. Uh, actually, there's a font, I think, before the color, so null, comma, then the color. But align is way the heck down below, so we didn't worry about alignment. Here's what that would all look like. So there's the label with its first parameter, null, null, and its color. Okay, like that. So we can do parameters in two ways, and we call that Zim Duo. So if it's convenient to just put the first few parameters, then go ahead and do that. But we needed to get to the align, which might have been after the bold and the italic and you know, a bunch of other things. And we'd have to go null, null, or undefined, undefined to get there. So that would be inconvenient. So we decided that it was easier for us to go to the configuration object so we could get right to the align without worrying about where things are. Okay, that's called the Zim Duo technique because it was built in Zim Duo version 2 of Zim. It's another one of these conveniences that we talk about that is absolutely amazing. That means that Zim has many, many parameters, almost anything that would be traditionally considered a property. They're all parameters, and we can either use parameters in order without the configuration object, or we can use a configuration object, Zim Duo. Yay. So it appears that 3.js is doing something not similar, but if you come on down here to where we bookmarked, there they are using the configuration object, but they don't have a way to just say texture here or whatever it is. They, they don't have the parameters in order. They don't have the alternatives. See the difference? And we thought that was great. It is great. It's great for Zim. And we thought we had invented it. And then uh, my, my kid, Pragma, said uh, just two months ago, like, 10 years after Zim's been going, two months ago said, Python does that. And it's like, what? Python does that? And we, we sort of took a look. So we had always proudly been sort of saying, hey, Zim Duo, Zim Duo, Zim Duo. And it turns out that um, Python does something similar. Python does it like this. It would be map equals texture. Just like we would do now, finally, in ES6, we would do default, um, default parameter values. Like that? Well, that's how Python does actually passing in the parameters, which totally makes sense. Wouldn't that be nice if we could do that? Uh, but we do, uh, we use the configuration object, or an object literal, and Zim has it so that you can do either. Yay! So that's called Zim Duo. Alrighty. We're now meshing the geometry to the material and adding that like so, we're positioning the floor in the normal way and rotating it around its X, so that gets us a floor. Here are the cylinders. Oh, I was just thinking, um, I forgot the other day to show you double-sided interactive material. Um, well, why don't we leave that for later, because this has been a long one. Some of our other examples that we're going through in our explorers will be shorter ones. So in one of those shorter ones, you look for it. I'm going to I'll jump back and show you what it looks like to have double-sided interactive material. It's really, really cool, but not now. I was going to do it in the bubbling, but then I mentioned it, but I forgot to do it. All right, cylinder. So hopefully, hopefully in one of the other, one of the other uh, explorers, I'll remember. All right, so here's the cylinder stuff. Yay, so there's our cylinder height, and that's the cylinder height there, and I guess these are in, oh, this is the radius of the top, the radius of the bottom, 
Uh, I don't know what that is, triangles or something. I remember polygons. Here are the various locations that we want. So this is just some raw JavaScript kind of stuff. Those are the locations that we want for the cylinders. Those could be adjusted. We're then looping through all of the cylinders that exist. That's that array of the Zim texture active objects. Each time we get the texture active object and we're getting I. Do we need I this time? We don't need cylinders at I. We can just get the cylinder there. And here. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking when I did this. Uh, locations at I. Yes, we do need a matching location at I. Okay, so these are will sort of match and we'll, we'll pull those with the, the variable I. So what have we got? Our current texture that we're working on in this loop is a new 3JS canvas texture. This is a cylinder. We were going to see down below here, it gets, it gets kind of easier. If you want to do a plane, like the, pan, the panel is on a plane, then you can use this three make panel and that solves, or not solves, it um, eliminates the, the four or five lines to, to do uh, this stuff. But anyway, here is on a cylinder. So how do we know it's on a cylinder? Do we make the cylinder? Yeah, geometry right here. We made the geometry once, and that's one of the benefits. We made the geometry once, and then we're going to um, map multiple times. So we are using cylinders. Why cylinders? Oh, not cylinders. Be careful. So this is the cylinder that we're getting each time, and I probably did the same thing down in the B-bar. Cylinders at I, but cylinder. Is there any other case of that? No, I don't think so. Okay. Sorry about that. Did you were you watching the video going, no, no, not cylinders. No, no. Hopefully you were. You're not just believing every word I say, are you? <laughs> you know, always try and watch with a critical eye. <laughs> your programming eye. Turn your programming eye on. Do 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 do. All right, so this the current cylinder that we're getting, you may not be used to the Zim loop thing. It's it's there's a JavaScript equivalent as well that we didn't actually know about when we made the Zim loop. It was kind of embarrassing. And we went, what? Is that new to ES6? And we looked and it's like, no, it goes way, way back. It was like a four each or a four in or something. I can't remember what it is. But anyway, um, Zim also can loop through containers, which that can't do, and it can loop through other things, and it all works in the same way. So it's very nice. All right, you might not be used, to, I was going to say, you might not be used to how the Zim loop is doing. Uh, we had initially said uh, we got the cylinders and then we went cylinders at I. Do you get it? That's that's how you would do it normally. You would say, hey, if I'm going through that, I'm getting I, then uh, cylinders at I is that. But the point of looping through the cylinders is um, getting uh, each cylinder. So let's use it. Okay, our material, we have to use a different material, otherwise get activity on tops and bottoms. All oh, right, yes. Even, so this is a cylinder, and we have this interactive material on it. So uh, coming back here, let's zoom in. Do I still have, I think I still have the old version. Let's refresh that. Where, where if I were even far away from it, I was interacting. Okay, so here's the cylinder. You see how we've got on this material, or on this side, or this plane, or whatever you want to call it, we've got um, the interactive one. You would see the same thing on the tops and the bottoms. Ah, I was like, oh no. So we could show you that. Is it easy enough to do? This was an array, so we want to take out the array. Okay, and so now, oh, I did the whole line. Okay, let's write that down. Will that work? I don't know, are we far enough away? So cylinder material is now just the one with the texture active. Oh, we did the, uh, this isn't the same. This is double-sided, but you can't really tell. Why did we make it double-sided? so that we can see the back of it. Yeah, so we don't care that it's interact. So this isn't really interacting with the back, but it's actually seeing the back. Because you see how we can see the back 
of it here. I think if we take that off, we don't see it. Is that right? Just do a check on that. Yeah, that would be the case. Hmm. I have made a boo boo. Can we lose the comma maybe? Okay, so if we come on Zim Explore, we're exploring. And yeah, you see how we don't see the back of the ring now because we didn't double side that. It's not whether we can see it from the back here, because if we turn around, we can still see it from this side, because it's always facing out. We can we can see it, but we can't see the back of that. So we want to turn this on again. And the other thing was is now watch what happens. You ready? Pum, pum, pum. So we're looking at the back of this texture up here. Check it out. So that the same texture is on every side and therefore if we go up here we're rising we can actually interact with it on the top of it as well so we may want that but probably not <laughs> right and fall uh, there we go and pause okay so that's what it would look like if we just did one material so we want an array of materials. With basically the cylinder colors transparent and opacity on the just the top and the bottom. Okay, so this is the side of the cylinder. Oh, and we need that comma again. Was your programming mind going, we need the comma, we need the comma? Or do you wait until you get an error and have the error tell you <laughs> something that almost says we need a comma? <laughs> Not quite. Wouldn't it be nice? You forgot a comma. That's simple. It's close. It's close. Some, I think I almost saw something like that, but not usually. It's more like something else is missing somewhere far away. Alrighty, we've got a tube, which is the meshing of those two things. We add that tube to the scene. We then are going to locate that, set it at the uh, X and Y, and there's the floor plus the half, yeah, whatever. The, the, every, everything in 3JS is center regged in the middle there. So you want to move that up in the height by half the cylinder height, and we added a little bit up so that it wasn't doing Z fighting. Z fighting is when two materials are basically in the same place, and you see some jigga, 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 jigga. So you want to see what that looks like. see it from far far away looks okay at the moment yeah looks looks all right I, I did have some earlier <laughs> I don't have the look the, the look down is turned off uh, I just sort of kept it only moving yeah it looks fine but I was seeing a little bit of um, kind of turns on and off there at the bottom where those two things meet. So I'm not sure why I don't see it now, but whatever. I'm going to leave it in just in case. Okay, and then we missed this line right here. This is the important line. All the rest of this stuff is 3JS. Well, that is Zim. Okay, so but that's taking the canvas and putting it into all the rest is 3JS stuff. This one right here is Zim on the texture actives. We're adding the mesh, which is the tube right here, the mesh. Add the mesh and tell it what layer that mesh is on. If we didn't do that, we would be in trouble. Bum, bum, bum. So we refresh here. Close that and I get close to here. Look, I can't interact with it. it. It's being ignored completely. Normally when I press down like that, it goes forward. I can just press and go right through it. Okay, so um, the reason that's the case is up above here in our texture actives, we set the layer that this will, the texture active will raycast that layer only. So if we pass in null, we're undefined there and refresh here, well, what will happen? Can you imagine? Will it work or will it not work? It works. 
So now we're raycasting every layer in here. Uh, as a matter of fact, the only other thing in here is a skybox. But <laughs> so all, all the rest is texture active anyway. Although, let's see. Yeah, this would even raycast the floor, I believe. Even though the floor isn't, you know, we're not needing the floor to be interactive. So it's better to, rather than raycast everything, to put something in there, like a 1 or whatever. And that can be 1 to 10. No, 1 to... I don't know, I can't remember, one to some the weird number, 24 or something. <laughs> All right, that's that's from 3JS. It's uh, turning ray casting to ray cast layers. And where is that that we wanted it? Not the floor, but each cylinder, comma one. Just down below here, where you see us doing the canvas window make three panel, there we are adding the canvas window. That needs to be interactive as well. But that one is, what is that one? Let's give us the parameters. That's the scale, opacity. Okay, let's have a look here. Texture active, the texture actives, plural. The transparency, the opacity. So it's transparent. I think it's transparent by default anyway. And the opacity is one. Perhaps we were playing around with that and just didn't put it back. Actually, I was kind of surprised that the opacity wasn't like a 0.8 or something like that or a 0.9. Let's have a look. And then the 0 0.05 is the scale. So we've made that quite a bit smaller to scale that down. So that's okay. That's okay. That's because our camera is really close. So if we look up here again, Our camera is at 100. In the previous examples, it was like at 500 or even 1,000, I think one of them is set at. So it just sort of depends on what you'll need. But there we are scaling scaling that. So if you didn't put that there, you'd be dealing with, I think the default is 0.5, which is an odd default, I know. But let's have a look. This isn't going to look very good. We're going to go, what the heck? OK, it's like, what the heck? <laughs> Can't, I can't move because movement is stopped. I, don't know, I think I can move that way, but anyway. Um, that's obviously not good because that's like stuck in the camera right on you. So the scaling might be important in that. And now we're going to scale it down. So you can either do it that way. You could have pulled the camera back and made everything bigger. Uh, you could reduce the size of the texture active itself. Like when we made that way back up at the top, we made the texture active as big as the stage. We could have made it smaller, and all that would have uh, affected your various scaling. Well, anyway, did we, fi did we finish this stuff up here? We were just talking about that one right there. That's the layer that it gets added to. Yeah, I think that's it. And so the lights, there's traditional lights. I did find in the new versions of, of 3JS, 155, uh, that I couldn't get the point light to work. I don't know. I don't know too much about lighting. Maybe I did something wrong. Oh, this is a point light. <laughs> okay, maybe it's not even working then. Do we have? Yeah, actually, it might not be. Let me go back to, or let me switch to a direction. Directional light? Directional light? Directional light. Maybe our point light wasn't even working. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay, yeah. Um, it depends. What do we do for our color our, our color management? Does it relate to the color management? I can't remember. There were two kind of things that kept on switching on us. We took the color management out because it seemed to be the same. We have uh, lights. We have legacy lights. We're not using legacy lights, so I think we're good on this. It's too bright now. But I'm just seeing if the Fong material, if, it, if we just had ambient on there, it may not have uh, given us quite the effects that we used to have. Now what's happening? There we go. I paused it. So that looks nice. I'm now getting the sort of the Fong effect with the lighting, but it's too bright, which means I'll just turn that down a bit. And that was at one, the ambient light. Let's. Let's turn the ambient light off and just try that again with a point light. OK, 
okay. The point light's not doing anything, as you can see there, even if we brought it up to two. Okay, point light not working. I don't know why. Um, direction, direction, directional light. And now we'll see, we don't have any ambient light. There, the directional light is casting some, you know, not shadows necessarily, but whatever you want to call that. I guess it's shadow, shade. The backing and the panel, they're different materials. This is a basic material, so we can see it without light. Same with the floor, we can see it without light. Same with the skybox. So we can see that without any light at all. But uh, these cylinders need lighting of some sort because they're a mesh Lambert or a mesh Fong. I can't remember which one. Cylinders are mesh Lambert material. Okay, so we'll keep that directional there. I put it at two. Maybe we can get away with just reducing the ambient light a little bit because that washed it out when that was at two. So we'll go to a 0.5 there and see, like I said, I'm not the best at lighting and so forth, but I guess if it looks all right, that's okay. So yeah, that's got, that's a bit nicer than it was before. Before, I think we were only getting directional and we weren't getting the same kind of effect. I can't see the white line on that as well. So I may need to do something about it. It's almost like I can't quite see the line. It's a bit dim still. So let's come back and adjust that a touch. What do we need? We could reduce this to 1.5 and bring that back up to 1. Let's have a look. See if we see the line, but still keep the nice colors. Not too washed out. I do see the line, but it's just a little bit too bright for my liking. It's not bad. So that was too bright. We'll drop that to 0.8. And what an explorer. And 1.3. Not bad. Probably good enough for our current situation. Yeah. That looks pretty nice. Okay, we've got some more shading going on there. Darker in the back, bright in the front. All right, good enough, yay! So we have lights, here's the dialogue. The dialogue's a lot easier. It's just, hey, I make a panel, pass it the, the texture active, pass it the texture actives that it works with. Why do we need to go true with here? That's transparent, I think that's default. We made it 0.8, I'm just goofing around there, and let's see what that looks like again, if it is. No, I think I can have that solid. I can see through that, but it's a little bit bothersome. It's a touch harder to read than it used to be. So I'm happy making that one. And 0.5 was the scale that we needed to get at. These guys probably are default now. We even need them. Nulls there. But that's kind of annoying to get to the scale. Perhaps we should use the scale before the transparencies. Hard to say. And some of the other ones, we weren't even needing a scale. So I think that that's just because we put the camera really close in this in this case. So that, that works just fine. There we go. And then we add that to the scene. Add the canvas window to the scene. Wait. I thought we added the canvas window to the camera. <laughs> okay, so we don't need to add it to the scene because we're going to add it to the panel. So what do we got? We got weight, uh, may or make without the HUD effect, scene.add camera. Yeah, why don't we just put a comma? Uh, could add to scene, but we add to camera below. This was our initial attempt at a HUD effect where we just take our 3D object. We make sure to add the camera to the scene. Thank you on, on I don't know, the internet where I found that. It was annoying. I was trying to add it to the camera and nothing would show up. It's uh, you, to make the camera work. You don't need to add the camera to the scene. 
and you can still orbit controls it, animate it, etc. and a camera looks. But if you actually want to add something to the camera object and see it on the scene, then you need to add the camera to the scene, <laughs> which kind of makes sense, and that's fine. So we've done that. We then took the camera window or the canvas window, which is this panel. We are positioning it back a little bit so that we, or no, forward a little bit. So that's forward from the camera. Back, back, out, outside or back behind us is positive Z. This is negative Z, so we're pushing it for back farther. And then we're adding the canvas window to the camera. And that, that's why it stays right in front of you. But for a HUD, so there it is, pushed 50 back. And note that as we turn, it stays in what we're looking. But for a HUD, it's more complicated because you've got the, the bottom left, bottom right, top right. And that stuff was harder to figure out, I think, because it just it would depend on how much you can see, you know, whether... I can see that much and you wouldn't be able to anchor those very easily. You'd have to do some calculations on it. So we found a better solution for a HUD and we made some examples for a HUD and we're gonna go over those in Explorers as well. But this one works for just a window right in front of you. It's probably easier than doing the HUD. So if you only have one pop-up window right in front of you, you may as well do it this way. If you've got more controls around the side, then you see the, the bubbling, or sorry, the uh, Explore on the hub. We do have a throttle on all of these. We found that on older Android devices, um, we're constantly caching to update that stuff and the constant caching just caused that to bog down. So if we're not getting a frame rate of over 50, we're dropping that to a frame rate of 30. That seems a little bit odd. But what was happening is as it's bogging, it just didn't seem to read the frame rate properly. So uh, we're, this was the way that we worked it out. Anyway, on, on a, we've got a five-year-old iPad, I think, and it works like butter. It's as smooth as pie on that. It's fine on computers, obviously, laptops, etc. cetera. But uh, that's a bit disconcerting uh, because some of the uh, virtual reality um, headsets and stuff like that are on Android, but I'm, I haven't yet tried and I'm looking forward to trying very much. That's one of the next things on our plate is to get 3JS and A-Frame going and try it on our virtual reality helmets. I come from a huge virtual reality background in terms of uh, playing. Do you want to see? Hang on, let me just uh, locate a folder for you called the Pagoda Scope. So this is the Pagoda Scope folder that I've got, and I'm Dr. Abstract. This is primarily where Dr. Abstract became Dr. Abstract, along with Zim. But I did all of these banners um, for the Pagoda Scopes. Let, let me find them. So here's the surf and mushroom thing. Probably can go through this way. The Pajama Rama. So I did all these Pagoda Scopes with towers that you climb and punk parties. And this was us bringing in uh, AI, but then we, we sort of uh, went and said, hey, uh, if we're bringing in AI, I don't want to mix it in with my interactive NFTs and stuff that I was doing. So we created this place called the Prompt Gallery and put all of this in here. But anyway, if I could have had throughout these things, I had this stuff on the, like this is interactive. This piece uh, or these types of pieces are interactive. They're all on the walls as, 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 um, uh, what would you call it, as interact or as art there. And I so badly wanted it to be interactive, but I never got it to be interactive. Let's see. Oh, I should show you some of the gallery things. Let's close out of that. So the galleries, will that find it? it says gallery. And let's look at some interactive pieces. For instance, this one right here. That's a puzzle. We're, we've seen that, that now we've got this in 3JS. So this puzzle right here, it's the Zim Scrambler, easily scrambles up things. Uh, these were on the walls in virtual reality as pictures. And I so wanted people to be able to just walk up to them and do the puzzle on the wall. And we were headed that way and then Altspace closed down, which is where I was working. Um, and, and building all these things. I, mean, I wasn't working at Altspace, but I worked within Altspace building these worlds. 
and it would have been wonderful to have interactive walls there. So that's where we're going. There, uh, I was just saying though, the Quest is an Android device. I think that the power of the Quest is more powerful than I got some old Samsung tablet or something like that. Samsung's got some problems as far as I can see. Maybe not newer ones, but I was on a tab, a Galaxy tab. Uh, but anyway, I think that uh, the performance will be fine on the newer devices. I'm looking forward to, to seeing that. With the throttling, it was acceptable. It's, you know, it's not great getting 30 frames per second, though. It would be nicer in the 60 frames per second. So, but isn't that cool? So this is where I'm coming from. And like I said, you know, did all sorts of uh, events at the Pagoda Scope and had a lot of fun there. As Dr. Abstract. <laughs> the Pagoda Scope itself was, uh, this was an older version of the Pagoda Scope, but we're basically inside a kaleidoscope. And as you can see here, it mirrors across all of these things. And this is where we put the video. This is Zim right here, Zim animating to sound. So we've got um, a frequency analysis and we can animate to sound. So this looked so amazing being inside this world and having uh, being surrounded by these walls of animated sound. Absolutely spectacular. Very, very beautiful. We can put that Zim animating sound now on textures quite easily inside of 3JS. I know you animate things to sounds as well, but uh, there you go. I mean, that's just something else we can do. We've got pens that we can draw with. Oh, this has been really long. Anyway, we've got um, pens that we can draw with as well in and that means that you can start drawing on walls. It's like, wow, there's so much we can do in Zim. And that's what this whole series of explorers will show you some of the, the beginnings. Okay, why don't we leave it at that then? I think we got through everything here. Hopefully that was a nice explorer for you. I am Dr. Abstract. I hope you have a nice day or night and come and join us at zimjs.com slash discord zimjs.com slash slack. We'd love to see you there. You can ask any questions and get involved. Cheers.